Welcome to Globally Speaking, your program that explores everything and anything to do with language localization. Are you ready to dive into the most critical issues impacting global brands today? Globally Speaking is designed to educate, inform, and challenge everyone who's engaged in global communications. Your hosts for Globally Speaking are Renato Beninato and Michael Stevens. Learn more by visiting our website at www.globallyspeakingradio.com. And now, here are Renato and Michael. I'm Michael Stevens. And I'm Renato Beninato. And this is Globally Speaking. And today we have an interview. We're going to be talking about global digital marketing. And our guest is Nitish Singh. But let him introduce himself. I am Professor Nitish Singh. I am a professor of international business, also teach global digital marketing and localization at the Boeing Institute of International Business, St. Louis University. And most of my research, consulting and work has been primarily been in the area of digital marketing and localization. So Nitish, how did you end up in the localization and globalization area? What attracted you to this area of knowledge? I stumbled into localization because as a PhD student, I was doing research in localizing websites for different countries. And my dissertation was to actually create empirically validated, theoretically derived framework to help companies localize and culturally customize their websites for different countries. So that's how I got interested. And then I got connected with various localization companies, firms, and clients. So this thesis is fascinating. So you were selling sort of a, was it a template that companies could use to cover... 13 regions, 16 regions, what was it that was actually part of your research there? What came out of that? What came out of that was a framework based on certain cultural symbols, semiotics, parameters, which a company has to address when they are localizing their content for different countries. And that was a broad framework, so it could be used for technically for any country in the world. And most recently, I actually got a grant from Qatar Foundation, and we actually developed a automated Arabic localization tool which basically scans the whole website of any company in German, English, etc. And then tells you from the cultural perspective, language perspective, symbols perspective, values as to what you need to do to actually localize the content, the digital content for Arabic speaking locales. Ah. So what you're saying is that if there is a picture of a woman showing her elbow, you would say, please replace Yes, we look into very specific practices, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example. This is a little bit sideways for a different group, which is the Hispanic Latino community. Let's suppose you are actually a food company advertising your products during a dinner table. The way the family would sit in a specific, like say, Hispanic Latino culture will be quite different than other cultures. So where the dad sits, where the mom sits, the grandmother, etc. So there is a lot of those nuances. When we talk about culture, we talk about the tip of the iceberg, which we see, but that there is a whole lot underneath. And that's what my research emphasis has been to actually uncover the iceberg, which we don't see that easily. Well, don't keep that secret from us. What is the difference? <laughs> yeah, what's the difference in the seating arrangements? The seating arrangements depends on, first of all, I'm not stereotyping, I'm just generalizing. Whenever I talk about culture, I talk in terms of a bell-shaped curve. So we are talking about the middle bulge of the bell-shaped curve. We were doing the focus groups with various Hispanic Latino users. So there will be like Central Americans, Puerto Ricans, Mexican Americans, etc. And you get all these nuanced differences. I don't recall which group it was, but it was a part of the Hispanic group. There is the father, which will be sitting at the top of the table, and then mom's little helper would be facing the kitchen side, and mom would also sit on the kitchen side. And then there is the whole hierarchy also with regard to grandparents. Yeah. So grandparents also get a prominent position. And one of the things which was really interesting, which came out of the research, was you know a lot of companies try to develop trust online. Trust is a big issue online. And one of the things which we came across, which is really important for developing trust, is grandparents. 
So if companies showcase grandparents, especially grandma, in the advertising where they are actually that trust generating figure, that actually really connects. Wow. But you know, you can just take these suggestions and just apply it mindlessly. It has to be properly laid out in a specific context and properly researched and implemented. Yeah, you're not selling the new rollerblades with grandma on them necessarily. Right. Where trust is a big issue on it. Right. I was going to ask you, you you just wrote an article called The Making of a World-Class Global Marketing Professional. And you talk very often about global marketing being organized in silos. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about this part of your studies? This was just a kind of a thought piece. And based on my own experience and based on my past research, and what I have seen is from the organizational perspective, there has been a tendency to have the silos, which are in almost every department, whether you're talking about accounting or marketing, etc. Also, what has happened is that the reason why there are these kind of silos in organizations is because traditionally universities have trained people in those silos, right? So we have the accounting student who never gets any idea of what ecology is. But when this accounting student gets into the job and with this 21st century globalization demands and the skills which are needed, this accounting professional will be reporting on uh, sustainability, environmental, social governance metrics to companies. But this person doesn't even know what ecology is, environment, etc. So the demands of globalization and the network economy are such that they are demanding organizations to break the silos and demanding educational institutions to train an individual in an interdisciplinary fashion because the skills, I just accounting skills are not to be siloed. Similarly, global marketing. Global marketing is such a unique and interdisciplinary skill. For an effective global marketer, it's not just that you take a few classes in global marketing. You have to have some background in languages. Ronaldo, you probably will agree with that, the linguistics aspects, but then also an understanding of intercultural aspects of communication cross-cultural aspects of communication, technology aspects of translation technology and localization technology. It's not something which just is part of a business school. There is a role here for the humanities, the arts and sciences to bring in their inputs and help create a professional which can actually balance between technology, culture, and the demands of globalization. That's a true global marketer. Nitish, is this something that you learn in school or is this something that you learn on the field as you develop? And and let me tie in that question to this certification program that you have developed. In a world where the reality is changing all the time, is marketing the type of profession that requires certification? You know, that's a really good question. And the answer is your first part of your question. You said, isn't it that the people will learn these skills on job, right? Yeah. And the amount of training time which companies are spending on individuals has been shrinking nonstop means from past years. Another interesting thing which we are seeing is that companies are actually complaining and telling us at the educational institutions that, hey, you are not preparing a world-class professional for us. The students you are sending don't have the skills we need. And that is a skills gap. So let's suppose um, you know, traditional marketing degree, they will talk about the four Ps and the you know all that seven Ps, maybe basics of branding and et cetera. But they are not prepared in terms of what specific social media content marketing etc skills which are more being used by companies tell me Ronato, how many companies are spending the heavy amounts of money on television and newspaper advertising versus social media it's, it's a rhetorical question Ronato. yeah <laughs> this budget has shifted completely in the last 10 years it's and it's, that's it's, why you need people yeah. who, who know how to work around that budget and effectively create campaigns but the educational institutions are lacking mm -hmm. it takes long time for courses to get approved. So that is why there is a need and that need is coming from the companies. And we have had such a great response for our certificate in global digital marketing and localization because it combines global digital marketing skills with the localization skills. And I have not come across any other program which gives this kind of skills. What are some ways that the certification keeps up with the rapid rate of change? 
it's doing exactly what you're doing is creating these excellent podcasts with industry professionals, with academics and other think tanks, and bringing in these cutting edge ideas together and constantly scaling your content and your course materials to reflect the changing reality of globalization. Is there a more project-based curriculum that comes through in these certifications? Yes, I mean, there are many certifications out there and there are different levels of skills. So there are aspects which can be done without specific projects, but then I feel having that experiential aspect is really crucial. And I'll tell you an example of that. At our university, for example, I teach international e-business, you know, global digital marketing. So what I do, I leverage online course materials to actually have students do the lectures and stuff online. The class time is primarily reserved for actually gaining experiences and doing hands-on projects and presentations, etc. Well, that's very interesting that the university is adapting to the new learning environments because traditionally, by the time you leave university, all you've learned is obsolete. Yeah. And what I've seen, and I, I imagine your program is that way, is that every semester you have a, a different curriculum. It's just not the the same content that you're rehashing for years and years and years like it used to be. Uh, you might be wrong in that. <laughs> <because> <laughs> Wishful honestly, thinking? <laughs> yeah, could be. But don't, I mean, academics wouldn't be happy if I said that is true, but that is mildly true because a lot of times the contents does get rehashed. And as I mentioned, academia is a little slow in terms of adapting mm-hmm. to change because think about it, the academia, our jobs are so secure, the environment is so secure, but now the there are pressures of that globalization and the millennials and the way they learn is actually putting pressures on professors to actually try to think about creating experiences and connect with them. I'll give you another example of a class. This is about a class I did on ethics of wrongdoing and financial fraud. And I leveraged online content wherein they learned about fraud and fraud triangles, etc. crime, etc. Class time, they actually went to probation hearings. They went and do the court case hearings. Then they went to the prison and talked to the offenders and their victims. Then they went to halfway houses and understand. And that not only tells them, you know, it's not book learning. It's like getting an experience and developing an empathy. And after that course, people were not saying them as criminals. They were like, oh, they're offenders and everybody makes mistake. Maybe they made a mistake and maybe, you know, seeing them as humans. So that's a change in perspective, which happens when you're giving these kind of experiences to students. Yeah. So were you successful in training good people on how to do fraud well without being caught? (laughs) I mean, I want to do that course. You and that course. Well, uh, the one, the, the place we were successful is to actually have empathy, empathy for people who are offenders because that was a bad judgment on their part. And everybody makes uh-huh. uh, judgments, big Absolutely, or small. Yeah. And understanding everyone who's involved with something like that. I heard John Cena, the professional wrestler. He's also in Good Morning America. Uh-huh. He was talking about talking to the guy who cleans the rings at the events they have, talking to the cameramen, beginning to understand and have empathy for everything they're trying to do well in their job so that he can do his better. And whether it's fraud, whether it's digital marketing, whatever it is, the more understanding we have of the whole process, the better we're able to excel. And that's a big task when we're talking about global marketing. Exactly. Global marketing is also about empathy. One thing which I see people lacking in as a global marketing professional is how to step out of their self-reference criteria. And when people have this kind of self-reference criteria, what you have is big time marketing blunders because they think, oh, I think it is right. So everybody else thinks it's right. So that's called self-reference criteria. You know, you're referencing the world based on your ego, based on your mindset. But like stepping outside your mindset and putting yourself in the shoes of your customer actually allows you to see things differently and probably helps companies to avoid all these marketing blunders. You and Renato probably know hundreds of them and so do I. Yeah. We had a very interesting podcast with Canva, and she shared with us a story about one of these learning opportunities through a minor blunder in Poland, where there was an email that was sent, and they learned from that process. And it's exactly what you have described, this element of 
being able to be humble to understand that you will make mistakes and you can learn from them. Right, exactly. Yep. Is there anything that you were prepared to tell us that we didn't ask you? Yes. My advice to the localization industry, and that is do not compete for the same old pie. Bake a bigger pie. Don't become a generic industry around translation, translation technologies, and translation and translation. Think of the role in more in upstream and downstream from a client need perspective. Why is client wanting translation? What is the need? What is the need behind translation? Once we, as an industry, understand the need, we'll be able to effectively deliver solutions. And the solution is not just translation. Solution is to help your customers connect effectively and hit the sweet spot of their end users in different languages, different cultures, different regions, locales, etc. I have been always kind of a little bit dismayed that our industry has been so much focused around translation. What is one example of this being done well that you could name? Who's been successful? Here is an example. The agency which wants to help a client and its goal is not to see how much they can make by translating stuff more and more of their translation, but their goal should be to actually optimize their localization budgets. And one of the tools I have, which I have researched, et cetera, is called Global Online User Segmentation Tool. By that tool, companies can understand to what extent their end users would like to see the content localized in their language and culture. Because a lot of times, it's not necessary to go gungo about localization. Sometimes customers might not need. There are segments called the intermarket segments. They are very much the same in the U.S. versus Israel versus Turkey versus Japan. We need to understand the end user and then accordingly optimize the localization budget for the companies, or for our clients. And then if you have an accurate way or a more accurate way to help companies understand, okay, your end users need this, and this is how you can fulfill it. And based on that, if you can actually work around and create a solution for your client, I think that will work much better than just selling a translation board count, etc. Mm -hmm. We agree with you. We do. Think deeply about the business. We have a unique yeah. opportunity to connect with people globally. And right. it's not just about changing words. Yep. And you're also a co-organizer of Brento Global, this new event that focuses on exactly the topics that you are sharing with us here today. What is the main value if one of our listeners is thinking about, uh, oh, I need to find a cool event to go to, why would they go to Brento Global? See, the reason why we started Brento Global is there is hardly any avenue for people, professionals, to actually share their experiences from the perspective of global branding, global digital media, global content management. There are many conferences, many avenues for, okay, content management, and they will add global here and there, or there might be a conference on localization, or there might be a conference on social media marketing, and they might add a little bit, oh, put these search keywords, etc. But Brand to Global is a conference where you actually have a unique focus. All our presentations are vetted and presenters are vetted to actually present on topics which truly have unique and intrinsic global theme. Great. Sounds like people could learn a lot from that. Thank well, you so much, Nitish. We yep. had fun with this interview and I wish you all the success with Brand to Global. And let's keep in touch and don't forget yep. recommending yes. this to your students. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Michael. And thank you, Renato. And I hope to see you at Practic Global then. Bye bye, Nita. Bye. Bye. This podcast was produced by Burns360. You can subscribe to Globally Speaking on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Globally Speaking, brought to you by Moravia. We'd like to hear your comments, suggestions, and feedback. So until next time, please visit online at www.globallyspeakingradio.com.